Hello, I'm Greg with Brownell Rights. Today we're going to be talking about trimming considerations, brass trimming. And this is a topic that, uh, you know, some people that don't even trim. This is kind of hard for me to imagine, but there's uh, quite a few precision rifle shooters out there that do not own quality trimming equipment because it's not something that they do very often. And that has always blown my mind. Um, and But at the same time, it does kind of paint the picture in a little bit better when you hear guys saying that, oh, you don't need to do this or you don't need to do that. Um, folks, the truth is they're not shooting small enough for anything to matter. <laughs> if you have a uh, high-end custom rifle built by a quality smith, then there's a good chance that your rifle is going to shoot half MOA or slightly better than just all the time. It doesn't matter what ammunition you feed it. It will shoot factory ammo good. It will shoot mediocre hand loads really good. And so that level of performance being able to be achieved so easily these days has led a lot of people to not even really search out better equipment or methodology on the loading bench. I'm going to point this out right here at the beginning. You can see a downrange effect based on how you trim, what you're using to trim, and the methodology that you decide to employ when trimming. And there are different ways to go about this, different techniques and different equipment. And uh, folks, you can shoot the difference if everything else in your ecosystem is correct. That means to say that if you're employing all of the correct things and you're not doing a proper job of managing the length and condition of the mouth on your brass, then it's very likely that you're leaving performance on the table. When you have your ecosystem worked out well enough and you are trying to maintain a sub-quarter MOA level of performance, you can start shooting the difference in the length of your brass at around a two to three thousandths of neck length variance. Now keep in mind here that I said neck length. Now we're gonna get into that in a minute, but the overall length of your case is one metric the actual bearing surface length of your neck is perhaps the most critical factor. Now, the overall length of your brass is not a trivial measurement either because the overall length of your brass is somewhat tied to the bullet or length to ogive or your bullet seating depth length. It is somewhat tied to those things. Brass trimming considerations are extremely important while wildcatting because the amount of work that you're putting into the brass, especially the neck, can show up in some non-uniform movement of the brass. And so you typically get more dispersion when working with a wildcat than you would a standard run-of-the-mill case. Now having said that, the quality of the brass has a large impact on whether or not you're going to have a uniform brass flow, no matter how many operations you're putting on it. So here, I've already pre-sorted and measured out a batch of 22 PRC Primal. Now this is uh, the first look that you guys are getting at the 22 PRC Primal. And uh, as you can see, it's just a 6.5 PRC neck down to 22 caliber with a 40 degree improved shoulder and a number of other little minor changes to improve that case. So I went through this entire batch of cases and I measured out. Um, what I was looking for is the extreme spread. So I wanted the shortest case as well as the longest case. So something interesting that you're seeing here is you notice how the case is wanting to pivot on one side. That means it is longer over here than it is over here on this side. And the reason that's happening is because one side of this brass has a thicker brass than the other side. And so the thick side inhibited brass flow more than the other side. So it's probably thicker over here than it is over here. And if I were to take a micrometer, I'd be able to measure that thickness variance from one side of the case to the other. And you can eliminate this in the neck area by turning the case, but that's uh, content for a different video. So here you can see our overall length of the case here is uh, on the shortest side, the shortest one we've got is two inches and 23 and a half thousandths. 
Then our longest case is two inches and 31 and a half thousandths. And so we've got a pretty decent neck length disparity there. Now, a lot of people's initial reaction here is to just grab their shortest case, set their trimmer up for a proper trim on this case, and then bring all of the long ones down into the short case's uniformity. And while that's probably a pretty good idea, we want to take a very minor cut on the small one, basically just put a chamfer on the ID and the OD, and otherwise leave the length pretty much the same, just enough to clean up the top of the entire surface of the mouth here. So a uniform cut, maybe we'll take a thousandth off of the overall length is all. We want that uniformity to exist amongst the batch. So we will trim the long ones to the short ones. However, before you do that, it's very important to examine how you're gonna be trimming these cases. Some case trimmers index off of the base of the case and they trim based on overall length. Well, some trimmers index on the shoulder. So the Gerard trimmer that I'm using indexes on the shoulder and a lot of those little drill powered jobbies that everybody uses, they index off the shoulder here. Get yourself a headspace comparator. And so here I've got a 420 thousandths diameter comparator. I'm gonna install that on the caliper and zero it out. And then I'm gonna take some headspace readings of these cases. And what I'm looking for is uniformity. So 1.6585 and 1.659. So there's a half a thousandth of variance between those two. And I have already measured quite a few of these cases and they're only a half a thousandth disparity and they're all right there in that same spot. A headspace variance is bad no matter what because whether you're trimming by overall length or whether you're trimming off of the shoulder as your indexing point, you are going to have an internal case capacity variance that happens regardless. Now, if you're trimming overall length, that non-uniformity of headspace is going to be less of a problem in comparison to the actual bearing surface problem that you'll create. So, this is a real issue to contend with. Now, I choose to in use cutting tools that index off the shoulder. The draw trimmer that I use, it does not concern itself with overall length. It allows me what I believe to keep a, a much tighter variance of actual neck bearing surface length. And I find that to be one of the more important things for consistent bullet release. Now, the cool thing about our AMP bullet seating press here is that we can have a look at some of these measurements in great detail during the bullet seating op. Now the rule here is that a variance that exists in bullet seating, whether it be bullet seating force or bullet seating distance, which would be indicative of like bearing length, right? The amount of bearing length of the bullet in contact with the bearing surface on the neck. That variance that you see during bullet seating will show up when you actually go to fire those rounds. And I can confirm in no uncertain terms that there is a correlation between that. So a, a bullet seating force or distance variance will show up on target if that variance is large enough. Now I've previously stated that I can, I can start seeing the effects of this when it starts getting anywhere between two and four thousandths of a variance in terms of this neck length problem. So if the necks are Within a couple thousandths of each other, I generally won't see the issue show up on target, or at least I won't be shooting well enough to be able to see it. But anything that starts approaching three, four, and certainly at five thousandths, I can definitely start shooting the difference. Here we've got inches of travel along the bottom, and we have pounds of seating force on the scale of the left side. This right here is the area we're gonna be focusing on for the time being. So again, this is essentially inches, and so this is uh, 175 thousandths, essentially, of movement. And this is kind of our starting point where the force starts getting applied and the bullet starts being seated. And so you can see here, this is 175 and 200, and our initial ones start happening right over here. So you can think of these expressed in thousands, 
And we've got here where they start, and right about here where they end is roughly seven to eight thousandths. And some of these are getting force applied much earlier than others, and that is definitely evidenced by the measurements that we took off of the cases. So this, this amp press is an extraordinarily good analytical tool that allows us to see these types of things show up for real. And then we can sort and cull our rounds that we seat based on the discrepancies that we see here. Now, despite the fact that that case length variance was showing up over here, you can also see evidenced the two different tests that I was performing. And so I was basically going through and trying a couple of different ops during the brass prep portion, and I wanted to see how they reacted. And so here we've got a bunch of traces that kind of trend right up and through here, and they've got a fairly uniform bump here. And then they start to scatter pretty wildly in terms of overall work done and the amount of force that's being applied. Whereas this group on the top has kind of a sharper, more sporadic spike up here close. And then they tighten up and stay tight and close to each other throughout the entirety. Now I'm not ready to reveal just exactly what I'm doing there yet, but this, this tool is very, very good at finding this type of thing where we can discover hey, this is, we've got some disparity here, or um, no, what we're doing is actually really good and providing a good result. And so what we're looking for is a very nice uniform application of force and having all of the results stay very tight to each other in terms of the amount of pounds of force that is getting applied throughout the curve. Very specifically though, on the graph, the start point of this force being applied and the variance that we see in it is where the case length of variance is borne out on the bullet seating aspect of things. Folks, it's super important that you make sure and verify the integrity of the batch of your brass before you start trimming. Because if you trim a non-uniformity into your brass, it's gonna be very difficult for you to get it out if you're working with an extraordinarily efficient case that doesn't have much brass flow. So if you do something like this with a BRA case or other 40 degree improved shoulder case, the chances that you're going to be able to shoot it out in relatively short term is not very good because a 5,000th disparity in a case that requires 60 firings to get <laughs> 5 thousandths of brass growth out of it, um, that's going to be very hard to deal with and that non-uniformity is going to be present for a really long time. So you have to make sure that your brass is stable and it has a good fully formed headspace and that there's no headspace disparity before you do your trimming off. It's better to just let it grow until your headspace is stabilized. Now, why would the headspace be not stabilized, you might ask? Well, if you're running mild loads or hard brass or any combination thereof, and you can actually take three to six, maybe even more firings before the brass is fully formed to your chamber. And I've produced other content on this, and especially those of you that are members at the apprentice level or higher in our mentorship program here on YouTube, you have seen the 40 plus long minute video where I describe all of the ways that this brass can move in detail. And you know that it can take several firings for this headspace disparity problem to get figured out. So you can't just let the neck length variance run unchecked just because you have the length for the brass to grow in your chamber. It's very common for most chambers to have a minimum of 15 or even 20 or 25 thousandths of room for the brass neck to grow independent of the shoulder or headspace measurement. So as long as you're setting your shoulders back uniformly during your sizing op, then you probably have a lot of room for the brass to grow. And that's indeed why the people that choose not to trim their brass very often get away with not trimming their brass and not having any mechanical problems is because the chambers have enough room in them to allow this brass to grow. However, it doesn't mean that the non-uniformity of the neck length will not affect their shooting. Because if you're shooting small enough, folks, or if you want to shoot small enough, this is something that's absolutely going to matter. And if you have a neck length variance of upwards of 3,000, you're going to start to see 
the disparity show up in your performance. Now, it might only show up as flyers, <laughs> right? I, I always wonder to myself, why does everybody else have flyers all the time and I don't seem to? <laughs> well, it's exactly because I am so very protective of all of these little areas in the case and this reloading process where variants can creep in and I systematically eliminate variants everywhere that I can find it every time I can. And so it's variants like this neck length, uh, neck bearing surface length disparity that causes some of those flyers. <laughs> but they're not actually flyers. They are directly attributed to and explained by the variants that you have in your components. So it's not only important to control this variance whenever possible, it's important to take into consideration what method you are employing, where your particular trimming equipment indexes off of, and try to make sure that you're not increasing the case capacity disparity or the neck bearing surface length disparity and choose the correct equipment in accordingly. Now, as I said, I prefer to use trimming equipment that indexes off the shoulder of the case, thereby limiting the, the uh, brass's headspace disparity and its ability to impart any neck length variance. And so I'm able to separate rather than stack tolerances. And I find that to work out very well for me. Now, this isn't to say that if you choose a trimming device that indexes off of the base of the case, that it's going to be wrong. What this is, is to say that if you have a headspace variance, then that headspace variance is going to lead to you having a neck surface, bearing surface variance that is going to be created when you trim. So if you're using overall length to set your measurement, it's ultra important that you do not have a headspace variance because that will directly be related to the amount of neck bearing surface that you have. Whereas if you're indexing off the shoulder, generally speaking, the amount of variance that exists between the shoulder and the top of the mouth will be very closely tied to the bearing surface of the neck and you will not create a uniformity problem there. Therefore, by indexing off the shoulder, I find that I can separate those things rather than have them become a stacked tolerance, and I can keep a better control over the bearing surface of my necks, which I've found to be very closely tied to the performance that I'm able to achieve on target. I hope you guys have enjoyed this segment on brass trimming and you picked up something valuable from it. If you have any comments, please do leave them below and don't forget to click the like and if you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe and then turn on that little notification bell icon to be notified of our future videos. All of these things does help our engagement with the almighty YouTube algorithm. <laughs>